would you take your Bibles now and turn to Matthew 20. Our message today comes from Matthew 20, verses 1 through 15. And we, of course, are continuing uh, to talk about the parables in Matthew uh, based on the kingdom. And remember, we have talked about from Matthew 13 what the kingdom is like. And now we're sort of looking at how we should live as citizens of that kingdom. Now, as God's people, let us give attention to the reading of God's holy word. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? May the Lord bless his holy word in our ears and hearts. The reason I entitled this message, Fairness, of which somebody has already asked me, was because our society has not only misused the term, but abused it terribly in order to beguile us into thinking differently than the people of God should think. Fairness is interchanged with equity. And both are used instead of equality which is a different in definition entirely. Quality simply means being equal in everything. So let me give you an example of that. Maybe it'll help. Before a game is played by 10 men on the basketball court, all agree to the same rules. And everybody abides by the same rules, right? And who enforces the rules? You have a referee who knows the rules and enforces those rules on everybody. That's equality. Equity, as it is used today, refers to the equality of outcome, which is different than the equality of opportunity. But what do they really mean from God's word? Should we be striving for fairness or equality? For everyone? Is that what we should be doing? Is it even possible to uh, 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 arrive at that point? How can we understand these, part, uh, these things from the, apart from the Word of God, or should we even try? It might help to ask a few questions first uh, about our own personal starting point. That might be a, a good place to start. What standard do we use to determine what is so, as 
Some of us attended a birthday party yesterday. And all the little kids got presents. And, you know, the first thing a little child does when he gets a present is look to see what everybody else got. What's his standard of fairness? What he got. And it's interesting dynamic to see all the little children judging their own gifts by what somebody else got. Does the scripture have anything to say about it? Well, the word for fair in scripture usually refers to the beauty of maidens or the weather. That's about as far as it goes. Uh, and only once is it translated otherwise uh, in Deuteronomy 25. And there it is translated as fair in speaking of weights and measures, although the word just would have been a better choice. And in several translations, you will find that. The word equity in Scripture is more often than not trans, uh, translated righteousness or straightforwardness. And so in our passage in Psalm 99, we had the word equity. And you could go back and you could look and, and just substitute the idea of straightforwardness or righteousness. And it would make even more sense. It says little about the equality of outcome that so many want to attach to that word equity today. You see, the striving after equality of outcome presupposes that there is some control or authority over all the circumstances. And we know that there's only one person that is in control of all the circumstances, and that is God himself. So we're going to look at our passage today, and from the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, I hope we can learn what is a biblical view of fairness, or to put it better, justice. I believe the answer to this question of does God treat all men fairly is by all means yes, in this sense that, well, that all men are the recipients of his mercy, his grace. You say, what? What do you mean? Well, God is continually upholding and working in his creation for all men. We read in Matthew 5, 45, he, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain, rain on the just and the unjust. And so we're praying for rain this week. I think we might get it. We certainly have been praying for a lessening of the heat. But, you know, as I, as I, I went about the city today, uh, this week, uh, this last week, as you did, I found out that it didn't matter whether you were a Christian or not, you were still hot. You see? And next week, or, or this coming week, what we're going to find is it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to get soaked if you stand outside. Okay. God is a merciful God, a gracious God, to give to his creation all that it needs. But God has also set out rules for his creation, and very early on, these rules were broken by mankind's very best representative, Adam. So, God justly condemned all men. He was treating them fairly. This is why we read that God looked and could find no one that did good. Just, just in your notes, write down Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there any, are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. That is an all-inclusive all. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. There are no exceptions. From the Old Testament, we know that all men are sinners. Let's seek to keep in mind that we deserve nothing from the hand of God that is good. As members of the human race, descendants from Adam, we deserve one thing from God and one thing only. And that is eternal punishment for our sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
though we are intelligent and know many things, we cannot compare ourselves to the Creator God who holds all things together and causes all things to happen according to His plan. And this is why everywhere you turn around, you see an assault upon this idea that God is in control of all things. There are many churches that want to deny that God is in control of all things. There are many Christians who functionally deny that God is in control of all things. I don't want to serve a God that is not in control of all things. Do you? What is our very definition of God in the West? It is a God who is in control of all things. The problem is not that we disagree on that. The problem is the degree to which we agree on that. Okay? Let's keep in mind that we deserve nothing from the hand of God except His wrath. But, as we will shortly discuss, God has not left us in this wretched state. And it is a wretched state, whether we realize it or not. He is not just the God of rules or justice when he, His rules are broken, but He is also the God of true love. Not this mushy, worldly stuff that we see on the Hallmark Channel, sorry. But rather the sacrificial, serving, perfect, sacrificial love that Jesus showed on the cross is the greatest example of the love that God has for His people. But let's keep this thought in mind, shall we? There is no word, nor deed, nor thought that is or ever has been or ever will be contrary to the command of God, whether it neglects to do God's command or does what is prohibited that will not be punished by God, including ours. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the future. And we need to remember that. We'll get back to the parable in just a minute, I promise. So what is our society, or why, why is our society so concerned about fairness? Well, it's because our society, like all societies, nations, and peoples, are naturally against God and His commands. Tell me something. If, if you fill a room full of sinners, are they going to think sinful thoughts? Organize sinfully, speak sinfully, do sinfully, especially if they're teenagers. Yes. If you put a bunch of Christians who desire to do the will of God in a room together, what will happen? They will act according to their nature. We hope. They will talk about the things of the Lord. They will worship. They will pray. People do according to their nature. Societies are made up of sinners. Therefore, every society is going to be against God. For a person to say something is unfair is to set himself up as a judge of what is fair. You see, the, the worker, the last worker paid, set himself up as a judge about what was fair. And the master of the house brought him to heal very quickly by saying, don't I have a right to do with what is mine? And the answer, of course, is yes. But the, the servant set himself up to be the judge of the master with no basis upon which to do that. We understand the need for this in a football game. For beforehand, all participants agree to the common set of rules. What chaos would there be if each player came onto the field with his own ideas about the, what the rules were? Sort of like a, a peewee football game. Okay? Isn't that the difference between the peewee football game and the high school football game? Over time, the coaches have instilled in them not just the need to be ready physically, but the knowledge of the rules. And as an individual, uh, an individual naturally wants to set his own rules. I know this personally, by the way. 
I want to set my own rules, don't you? I get upset when things don't go the way I want them to, don't you? So society also wants to set its own rules. But God has established how he wants his universe to rule or to run, and his rules are supreme. Now, we may not agree with that. I think we probably in this room all do. But remember, people don't want God to rule his universe because they want to rule his universe. And then they want to stop calling it his by, acknowledge, uh, by ignoring that he exists or by denying that he, he has any authority or calling him a myth. And then they want to rule his universe as their universe. There is a parable that Jesus told of the workman who killed all of the representatives of the owner because they wanted the vineyard for themselves. That's what we're talking about. Let's remember that sinful man at every level wants to take God's place of authority and be a God himself. It's what Adam and Eve were tempted with when Satan said, God knows that when you eat, you will know the difference between good and evil and be like him. When we are addressing today as a pagan society coming out, uh, or what we are witnessing today, is a pagan society that is coming out from the shadows and openly defying God by redefining words, by laying a false guilt trip upon everyone who would think differently than them, and seeking to control the minds as well as the lives of everyone in society as if they were the creator God. Did you know that there was an article out this week that the Biden administration is now going to come after your ceiling fans? I had dinner last night with my son and wife, and, and we said that, and, of course, Peggy looks at me and says, What's wrong with ceiling fans? And my son immediately looked at her and said, Well, Mom, nothing's wrong with ceiling fans. It's just the next thing on their list that they can control. Dear ones, this is not a political issue. This is a religious issue. This is a spiritual issue. Because those who would have the government be that much in control would love for government to be worshipped. The biggest idol in our society today is the government. And there are people that worship the government. And I'm not anti-government because God establishes the government. I'm anti-worship of an idol. Because God is the only God that deserves our worship. There are two things that immediately come to mind that greatly disturb me about the state of current affairs in our society and in the church at large. So understand this is not a political sermon, nor are we a political church. But I'm going to tell you something. We serve the living God. And if it's the government that begins to think of itself as an alternative or a rival to the God that we serve, then it'll become real political. That's what we need to do. We read in Isaiah 5, 20, Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil. Who put darkness for light, and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet. And sweet for bitter. Now, how many of us in this last week, as we sort of got snippets off the news or, or whatever, how many of us thought that's exactly the opposite of what's the truth? This is what Isaiah was talking about. This is what is happening. And you think that we're going to say nothing about it? When our society is saying that which is wrong in God's word is right, and that which is right in God's word is wrong, 
and offering up something that they say is sweet when the Word of God says, no, that's bitter. Oh, and here's information. Here is knowledge that is light when it's darkness. You think that's what we're going to stand by and watch and say nothing about? No. In the church at large, we see a growing abandonment of the personal knowledge of and the personal authority of the Word of God. I have been privileged to be able to meet with a man and a woman where the man just became a believer and the woman has been a believer for a while, and yet I asked them to open their Bibles and she points at the Bible he has and said, there's our Bible. I said, I didn't say our Bible. I said, your Bible. They share a Bible. That's fine. I said, when you go to church, you can share a Bible. But when you study the Word of God, you need to get a study Bible of some sort. And I'm going to try to help them find them. And you need to use it as a notebook. Write in it. Make notations. Become a student of the Word of God. You know, we don't write too many love letters anymore, do we? I think we're probably the last generation that will discover love letters all wrapped up in a shoebox by our parents when they were dating. Probably the last generation to do that. And so, we, you know, we look at that and we say, What's going on here? And we realize these things are not just old. They are worn. You know why? Because mom pulled them out and read them over and over and over again. You know why? Because mom loved dad. It just did her heart good to know all over again that dad loved her. The Bible is God's letter to his people. It reveals to us who he is. It reveals to us how much he loved us. It reveals to us how much he's forgiven us. It reveals to us who we are and how much he loves us in spite of that. And yet there are Christians that don't know where Malachi is have no idea how to find the story of Joseph. And the only chapter that exists in Revelation has to be Revelation 21. It's the only one that's ever preached on. Are you knowledgeable of the Word of God? I hope so. And if you're not, and you don't want to even admit to it, fine. Do something about it. The Word of God must be personal. Our knowledge and our admission that it's authoritative in our lives can't just be, yeah, I belong to a church that believes in the authority of the Word of God. It's got to be, I believe in the authority of the Word of God. I love the Scripture. I want to study it. I want to know it. So when I say something along the lines of, yeah, boy, don't let anybody with a, a, a tent peg and a hammer get close to you if you're not obeying the Lord of God, you'll know where it's coming from. Where is the fervency of Christians for the things of God? David wrote in Psalm 119, verse 11, Your word have I hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he quoted scripture. I want us to realize that just holding a Bible and reading it upon occasion is fine and good, but it's not nearly enough for what the devil is throwing at us on a regular basis. And the Word of God is powerful and effective. And it will help us if we know it. If we don't know it, it won't. Where's the boldness of those who should have no fear of man? 
Luke 12, 4 and 5 says this. I tell, this is Jesus. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. And after that, have nothing more than they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. You know who him is? Not Satan. Satan has no authority to throw anybody into hell. It's God himself. By the way, that's why when I was a child and I would read Fox's Book of Martyrs and I would find out that the English were, uh, Catholics were so mad at one of the great reformers in England that they dug his body up and hung him. I thought, he doesn't care. He did. He's in heaven. But they were really angry. But they thought that would, that would be significant. Didn't matter a bit. Jesus is saying, they can kill your body, and after that, they don't, there's nothing more they can do to you. Why fear them? Where is the working knowledge of God's word increasing among God's people? That's a question I think we need to ask. Colossians 1.10, Paul says, Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Oh, let this not be so among us. Let us fall on our knees and beg our Heavenly Father to fan into flames the gifts that He has given to us in this life to be found faithful in Him and faithful to Him. Better to be found actually growing in Christ than just intending to grow in Christ when he returns. What do they say? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Oh, I always wanted to grow in Christ. I've got my Bible at my bedside ready to go. If your Bible is not used to write upon the tables of your heart the word that is found therein by the Holy Spirit, it is useless. You might as well use it as a doorstop. Please, let's not be found among those who ignore the word of God. What is the correct way then for us to understand fairness? How should we as Christians deal with the, what the world is trying to get us to think? After all, we do live in a world where we are increasingly pressed in on all sides by the world's definitions for just about everything. Well, first of all, let's use the correct term. I put fairness as the title so you would wonder. Worked, didn't it? I referred earlier to the only passage in Scripture where the word fair does not speak of the weather or the beauty of maidens in Deuteronomy 25. The better translation would have been just or right. And let me tell you something. It's interesting to note that wrong measurements are an abomination to the Lord. He doesn't like wrong measurements. You know why? Because he said, this is how I want my world to run. Here's my law and don't change it. And boy, do we not live in a society where everything is being redefined and redirected to a definition, not God's. This is why the best understanding when we use the term fair is simply to use the word just. If I am not happy because something is not fair, the problem is not in something, it's in me. Because I'm setting myself up as a standard for what is right and what is wrong. And because I am a sinful, self-centered individual, and so are you, I'm going to set the standard based on my best interest. But I do not know what is best for me. 
God does. God says, trust me. Let's go right, read uh, Proverbs. 3, 5, and 6, I believe it is. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. Because your own understanding will lead you astray. So trust in God's leading. So the first thing we need to do is get our terms right. So when somebody says, well, that's not fair, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by fair? Well, they shouldn't have gotten that, and we shouldn't have gotten that. Well, who says we? I mean, who's the determinant? Who's the authority here? Secondly, we need to remember that God is always just in all his works and expects his children to act in the same fashion. We should be a people of truth. We should be a people of justice. Not social justice, God's justice. Ecclesiastes 8.5 says, Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise in heart will know the proper way and the just way. You know God's command, you'll know the just way. We read in Revelation 15.3, the words of the saints in glory. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Wow. Lastly, let's not expect the, the world to understand that being just or fair, well, they, they can't understand what it really looks like. They don't have the eyes to see it. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. They cannot understand God's definition any more than we could beforehand. But think about this. Society thinks of fairness according to its own rules, not God's. Society defines justice, leaving God and his commandments out of the equation, right? The world is going to do what its nature dictates and its nature is sinful to the core. Why do we expect, why are there Christians, why are there churches that are pushing social justice when there is no such thing as social justice? Why? I'm going to tell you there are a lot of churches out there that have nice big buildings and steeples and choirs and, and ministers in flashy robes and, and all kinds of stuff like that. But I'm going to tell you they're not churches. Because they're not the gathering of the saints for the purpose of the worship of Almighty God. That's not what they're gathering for. And if you don't believe me, just Google the Sparkle Creed. Anybody here seen it? If you dare, go Google the Sparkle Creed. It's the most blasphemous, worldly, sinful thing ever to masquerade as something religious and God-honoring that I have ever seen. And yet, hey, we've got people all over the place that are holding to the Sparkle Creed. As a matter of fact, we read some astonishing words in Revelation 22, 11. I'd never thought I'd see this because I thought the, the goal of the church was to win the world. Let the evildoer still do evil. Let the filthy still be filthy. And the righteous still do right. And the holy still be holy. In other words, there's going to come a time when you're not going to be able to change anybody's mind. You're not going to be able to have the luxury of worrying why the world isn't getting better. Your only concern and my only concern will be, oh Lord, help me today to live in a way that pleases you. By this we see that each person will act according to his nature. The loss by their sinful nature, and we're certainly seeing that come out of the shadows and, and be unashamed when they should be in their actions. And the redeemed by their new nature in Christ. And hopefully as we mature, we will see that happening. Let me tell you something. 
I cannot tell you over the last 30 years how many people would come to me and say, I have read the Bible through X number of times. I say, great. Did it have any effect? Oh, man. I am not the same person. You want to you be different? You want to be a real warrior for Christ? You want to be a, a significant member of the, wor of the family of God because you know God better? Read the Bible through. Start September 1st. By this time next year, you'll be significantly different. With all this being said, how does this help us act in this world as citizens of God's kingdom? Why is a simple change in wording so important? Well, to remember that God is just is to acknowledge him as the rightful judge of all men, the lawgiver and the rightful ruler of all things. To have this idea of God's justice versus social justice, God's rightness versus fairness is to acknowledge that and to bow before him in humble awe of his infinite power and his greatness. You know, some of us might be tempted to be afraid of the government. And there is no doubt that there's a lot of power there. Just stop paying your taxes for a while. You'll find it. Don't do that, by the way. But you need to understand something. Our God is infinitely greater than any government. And nothing will happen to us outside of his divine will and a desire for his own glory. Nothing. To acknowledge that is to acknowledge our own need for a Savior. And because our sins must be paid for, remember God is just. By the way, think about this one for a minute. How does God remain a God of justice and save some, though some are not saved? Well, our sins have been paid for. Justice has been served. Jesus paid for our sins. That's how. God is not violated his own justice by letting us sweep in to heaven without our sins being paid for. And if Jesus has paid for our sins and we are citizens of heaven, and we should be thankful that he is just and that we are his and that he has accept, accepted the sacrifice of Jesus for us. Don't you think? His justice has not been violated by sweeping everything under the rug so that we can escape hell. Rather, his justice has been satisfied by the shed blood of Jesus on our behalf, and so he can save us from hell and give us a place in heaven. Wow. That's not being very fair, is it? The answer to the question, even though Peggy would initially disagree with this, because she did when I told her what I was preaching on, the answer to the question, is God fair, is yes and no. Yes, because all sins must be paid for. No, because he has chosen some for eternal life and some for eternal destruction. But the choice is his, not mine. So what should my response be? Well, I would call us then to rejoice in his mercy. We should be excited about his blessings to us. There's the last thing that we, the world needs to see is a bunch of long-faced Christians. Now, I'm not, I, hey, look, I'm Presbyterian, okay, so holding my hands up is almost painful. But in the praise and worship of Almighty God, I think, that would be okay. At least mentally, let's rejoice. 
Let's be a happy people because we are bound for heaven. Don't wait another minute to study the word of God and rejoice in the God of the word. What, what did the master of the house say to that servant? Am I not allowed to do? To, to do to choose what to do with what belongs to me then what did he say he said or do you begrudge my generosity has God been generous with us yes he didn't have to enter the master didn't have to enter into a deal with the first worker at all, but he did. God didn't have to save us, but he did. Let's not begrudge his generosity, but rather let's rejoice and with humble and thankful hearts. Let's, let's be joyful. That's what he calls us to be. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you. We are humbled by all that you have done for us. Lord, we don't deserve it. But it is ours in Christ, and we will not begrudge you the worship that is due your holy name because of what you have done for us. Father, by your Spirit, protect us from the wiles of Satan who would work his way into our thoughts even to change what we think. Give us a holy hunger and a thirst and an excitement for your word that your spirit might work it into our hearts, that it might be engraved there permanently. Lord, give us the joy of your salvation. Give us that peace that passes all understanding, but give us that excitement to know that every day we get to see your plan unfold, not ours, but yours. For yours is so much better than anything ours could even hope to be. Thank you, Father. We pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior, your Son. Amen. Mm -hmm.